Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Thank you so much for joining me. We are here today to talk about your new book, Dementia Prevention, Using Your Head to Save Your Brain. So why don't you introduce yourself while I like get myself unflustered? <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't tell me that fading memories was autobiographical. I thought yeah, for real. <laughs> <laughs> There's a, there was one last button I hadn't hit and oh, Lordy. At least I'll be uh, in better shape for next week's live. <laughs> I'm Dr. Mitch Kleonsky. I am a clinical neuropsychologist, which basically means that the bulk of what I do is to see people who have concerns about their thinking abilities, to interview them, look over all of their medical records, and have myself or a member of my staff administer a series of tests. Each of the tests will measure different mental abilities. So we have tests of attention, tests of short-term memory, problem-solving, communication, intelligence. We look at their emotional status. We oftentimes will do a family interview to get someone else's perspective. Then we take all of the scores and ratings from our tests and compare them with what a person like them is expected to be able to do. So based on their age, their education, their occupational background, and we even throw in a little test of reading ability, which gives us a finer discrimination of how they should be able to do. And then we see if everything is lining up the way it should be, which often allows us to then reassure them that everything's okay. Maybe it's due to you know, stresses in their life. Maybe it's just something that their family is concerned about but they shouldn't be. However, in many cases, we see people who are having some differences between what they should be able to do and what they're actually able to do. So for those people, we quantify how much that is, what part of their thinking it involves, what we think it means diagnostically. So I'll get into that in a little while about different kinds of diagnoses that we look at. But most importantly, what we can then advise their doctors, their healthcare professionals, their family, and them to do to either slow down any worsening of what's going on, kind of stabilize it at that level, and in some cases, improve how they think and their abilities. So that's what I'm really about, is trying to use this as an objective way of launching a discussion about change. And how to go about it. Change. The one thing us humans don't particularly care to do. Especially as we get into middle age. One of the things we talk about in the book is that change is really welcome when we're young. Think about the excitement. Mm -hmm. I get to stay up late. I get to go and visit with friends overnight. I get to go to school. I get to drive a car. I get to go out drinking. <laughs> I get to do all these different things that are all markers of change in our abilities and independence. Then somewhere in midlife, we nail it. We got it all figured out. <laughs> and so at that point, we think, why would I ever change? Because I'm pretty perfect right now. <laughs> the problem is life is a constantly evolving thing. And the abilities that we need to cope with later life are oftentimes different than what we developed earlier in life. So we need to be constantly adapting, constantly changing. Whatever doesn't adapt, dies. That's, That's the true. history of evolution. You know, if you're uh, the horses and buggies, but there's a place near where I live in Massachusetts, uh, Westfield, Massachusetts. It's the buggy whip capital of the world. At one time, the factories there manufactured more buggy whips than any place else. You know how many buggy whips they manufacture today? Probably not many. Well, zero. Oh, zero. <laughs> There's no, because they had to adapt. I don't know what, I don't think they adapted. I don't think they went into anything new. But that's what uh, what adaptation is. And a lot of times people look at it and say, you know, I, I really don't know how to change at this point. And part of what we do is to break it down 
into small steps. What we do in the book is to provide people with guidance about how to make change in a way that's possible and in a way that is not so difficult for them. Well, maybe before we jump into that, we should remind people or tell people that maybe haven't heard this before. I swear I tell this to everybody, but what memory issues should jolt um, us to maybe seek medical, um, a, not a diagnosis, but testing to see, you know, if it's like, I know if I don't get a good night's sleep, my brain just, pff, first off, it wants sugar, something fierce. And it's amazing how just one poor night of sleep and the, the thinking process, you'd think that I didn't sleep well last night since I was having trouble with the technology, but that wasn't the case. What, what, what is normal aging and what should we be concerned about? Great question, difficult answer. <laughs> and the reason for that is there's a huge out overlap between normal senior moments and things that are concerning. What we really should be doing is that every six months or a year, when you go to see your healthcare professional, they should be not only taking your blood pressure, they should also be doing a brief measure of thinking. Because that, imagine going into your doctor's office, your doctor says, how's your blood pressure? <laughs> and you say, I don't know. How should I know that? Well, you know, if you have headaches. Well, no, no I don't have headaches. Do uh, you feel differently? Well, no, I don't feel differently. That tells us nothing about whether your blood pressure is under control. The doctor is going to strap a sphygmomometer on your arm, take your blood pressure, unless you had it done at the grocery store or the pharmacy, and hopefully you're using pretty much the same one. because They do vary. So you want to go back to the same pharmacy. And that's going to determine if your blood pressure is under good control. Well, the same thing should be true for cognition. Part of the reason why my wife and partner, Dr. Emily Kleonsky and I, developed a five-minute test for cognitive change called the Memory Orientation Screening Test, otherwise known as the MOST. <laughs> and this was at one point used by two very large corporations and distributed. Right now, we have taken back the rights to this and our plan at this point is to start developing it as a home-based test so that if you have a loved one, that you could do this test with them in the privacy of your own home and then go to the doctors and say, I'm concerned, here's the data. Would you please repeat this or a similar test? And then we should go and get blood tests. And then we should go and get an MRI scan. And then we should think about medication. So all those things would be triggered because truth of the matter is, unfortunately, most doctors do not do a good test of cognition. And they count on people to complain. And then once they complain, assuming your doctor is of about the same age, your doctor is likely to minimize and say, oh, yeah, I do that too. So now you've got a complaint. And I've got people come to me and I say, why are you here to die? They say, well, I've been complaining to my doctor for two years. Oof. Finally, my family said, I'm worried about so-and-so. That's what triggered it. Up to that point, their doctor was telling them that they also forget things, that they also can't come up with words that they want to use. And they walk into a room and say, huh, what brought me? What am I doing here? <laughs> and leave their coffee cup someplace. So all of those things can be normal, or they can be admirable. We don't have any way of separating. It's not like... How many episodes of forgetfulness do you have per hour? And once you have more than two or three per hour, it should trigger something. There's no way of measuring that. So you need something that's easy enough to do that can be done at home that you can then take the doctor and say, okay, now you've got my attention. Let me do something or let me refer you out to somebody like me, but not me. I've got plenty of patients, but somebody <laughs> like me who will then take you in for a couple of hours of testing and really measure an objective, because that's the best way of starting. You get a real measure, and then when it's abnormal, you start to look for why. And then you start thinking, what can I fix? Well, I do know things like, well, I, I liken an aging brain to like an aging computer. 
you know, you get the latest and greatest computer and it boots up and it does all these things and you can run multiple apps and programs and it just boop, 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 does its thing. And then as it gets older into the technology, it does all this stuff, but maybe not as quick. Maybe it doesn't run the latest app, but it's fine. And then you just kind of keep getting to where it, it functions. It does what it needs to do, but it doesn't do anything fancy. So that's kind of how I equate to a normal aging brain, which normal is, you know, air quotes because everybody's different. But I do know, I do know the 10 warning signs. Well, I used to, I haven't quoted them in a long time. That's not going to help you. Those do not detect anything of value. And if you ask someone, we did this, we actually published this study in the Journal of Family Practice about 12 years ago. And we took a consecutive sample of, I think, 150 patients. We asked them to rate themselves one to 10 scale on five different things. How good is my memory? How good is my attention paying? How good is my language? How good is my problem solving? I can't remember what the fifth one was, but there was a fifth one that, that related to those as well. And we had their families do the same thing. And then we actually tested them using objective measures. What we found is these were all people coming in to see a neuropsychologist, about half of whom had already been diagnosed with cognitive difficulties, either a mild cognitive impairment or dementia. And what we found is that their self ratings correlated or predicted their actual test scores mm-hmm. zero. It was mm-hmm. the most amazing data I've ever seen. Because it wasn't even zero point something. It was absolutely zero. Now, the family ratings were a little better. Their correlation was about 0.3. So that's a mild, not not terrible, but but not great. The brief testing that we did, this five-minute test, predicted at 0.87. So what you're saying with this is, don't bother asking people <laughs> a quick test. Don't bother asking the family. Give the person who they're bringing in a quick test. That's going to give you a much better hit rate for who should be tested more. And don't drive yourself nuts with the symptoms because they so overlap with normal. So, and the, one of the phrases that we use in the book is don't be a dementia warrior. Become a prevention warrior. I don't want people spending their time wondering if they have dementia. I want them spending their time doing things to protect their brains against dementia. So we know that one out of every two cases of dementia is preventable. That's significant. Yes. It comes from two very large studies. The first is a study many people heard about. It was published first in 2017 in Great Britain known as the Lancet Commission. Lancet is sort of like our New England Journal of Medicine. Okay. The Lancet Commission had about 25 different scientists who were on their panel. They crushed all of this data. And what they discovered was there were 12 factors that they could point to that had significant impact on someone's dementia risk. And then putting them all together, they calculated that they could reduce the likelihood of dementia by 40%. They then looked at this again in 2020. They added one more factor, came out with similar, I think it was 42% at that time. Now, in the United States, a different group of researchers took the same factors, applied it to the data from about 2,000 people in what's called the United States Health and Retirement Survey. Where they followed people over this course of time and looked at their dementia risk. Applying the same factors, they could reduce dementia risk by 60%. That's so, significant. It's all significant is the point. We're splitting the difference. 40 and 60, I'd say one out of two can be prevented. That's huge. If we had a medicine that could cure one out of two cases of dementia, Think what that would mean. People would be lined up for miles, paying whatever it costs to get this. Because unfortunately, so often, we wait until you have a problem before we fix it, rather than looking ahead and saying, let's do, let's pull that candle away from the drapes. 
rather than waiting for the fire trucks to show up when the whole apartment building is on fire and the cameras are there. That's really sexy gets a lot of notice. Prevention, not so sexy, but it's a lot cheaper. So that's what we're that's really the whole mission here is dementia prevention, because this would save billions of dollars. Yeah, family so caregivers are almost up to a trillion dollars in in free health care in a year, which is a lot of money. And, you know, and I've made this statement many times on my show that until corporate America realizes that Alzheimer's and other dementias are affecting their bottom line right now, you know, they they got to get in the fight too. And until the average case of dementia costs a quarter of a million dollars a year. That's a lot of money. Exactly. And half of those are preventable. <laughs> Think about the savings there. I'm not good with math, but those numbers I can do. When yeah. you can put dollar signs in front of it, I, I get a little better at the addition and multiplication. <laughs> the problem with prevention is that people think it could be just one thing. They ask you things like, what's the one thing I can do that will really reduce my risk? The answer to that from our perspective is that while dementia prevention is a thing, it's not one thing. It is actually a combination of what we have in our model as potentially up to 25 different things. Ooh, Not this all is a lot. of those are necessary for any one person, which is why part of what we do is to provide a checklist so people can either take it in the book or for free, go up to our website, which is called braindoc.com. They can download this checklist and actually see where they are and what areas they are on target and what areas they are off target, what areas they're pretty close to target. Those areas that they just have to tweak a little bit. Their blood pressure is a little high. Their blood sugar is a little high. They're walking some, but they're not walking enough for good exercise. All those things are adjustable. So if we could get people just to pay attention to some of those factors, the downstream effect, even starting early in midlife, from a corporate standpoint, if you could have a corporation and keep your top thinkers healthier mentally, well into the point where they would retire or maybe even re delay their retirement, that would really translate into a lot of important information, a lot of important value for companies. So it's really something that should start in your 20s and 30s, not waiting until you're about to retire to say, well, maybe. Now I could pay attention to my brain. <laughs> well, I, I did my dementia checklist in my 40s. Uh -huh. I had a doctor. I was a photographer and I had a doctor as a client. And she said, wow, you've got a family history of diabetes, which was my dad's side of the family. You're overweight, which I was very. And you're screwed. That's what she told me. Perfect term because. My little pea brain went, hmm, I'll show you screwed. <laughs> and so I just decided then I was going to figure out what it was nutritionally and exercise that I could do to lose the weight. And I did. I lost over 100 pounds a decade, about a dozen years ago. And I've kept most of it off despite that time of life in a women's, woman's world that the weight comes back on like crazy and caregiving for my mom and dealing with my dad. Um, and I was just, I was recording another episode earlier today and I told the gal, it's like, I generally don't start my day till late morning because I don't feel fully awake until I've done my workout. And, you know, 15 years ago, I would have laughed at you if you, if I had, if you had said, well, you're going to tell me that in 2023, I would have been like, yeah, you're smoking something funny, <laughs> but it's true. Yep. And you probably learned that exercise is sort of an addiction after a while. I'd really miss it if you haven't done it. Yeah, it's not like I really enjoy it. I That's enjoy right. the challenge of, of continually trying to improve. Mm -hmm. But while you're doing it and you're huffing and puffing and you're sweating and eh, I'm not sure joy is the right phrase, but. Yep. So sometimes the best part of doing it is, you know, you don't have to do it again for another 24 hours. That's true. Yeah, that is true. Or, you know, the instructor says, okay, it's only 30 more seconds. You're like, fine, I can do it for 30 more seconds, maybe. Yeah. But, but that's yeah. a good attitude because, you know, 
people, there are some people who are blessed with getting that like runner's high. And they feel so euphoric after they've run or worked out. Like you, I have never experienced that. It's always, okay, what do I do to distract myself to get through this? How do I make it interesting enough so I can stick with it? How do I vary it enough or back off of it and then come back to it in this period of a small amount of time so that it remains interesting and challenging? And that's okay. Nobody says, your brain doesn't say you have to enjoy this. All it says is you have to do it. Yeah, that's a good point. So what, so looking at the dementia checklist, Mm -hmm. can you summarize it for us a little bit? I know you said there's like about 25 things. We break it down into several clusters. Okay. There's the cluster that has to do with the things behind you that you can't change. Your genetics, your prenatal care, your early life experiences of being nurtured or not, your education up to the typical level that most people stop going to school, all those kinds of things, and, and maybe head injuries through sports or auto accidents or jumping off the roof of the garage to have someone dared you to do it. So those are the that's where we start. The next area we look at is midlife cardiovascular issues. So that's when the blood pressure and diabetes piece are really featured. And both of those will be impacted by things like smoking, by not exercising, by sedentary lifestyle, and by obesity. And the question with obesity is not one of shame. It's a question of what size body was my body intended to be? Because that's what my heart and my lungs and my brain are going to support. So the closer I can be to the size I'm supposed to be, regardless of all the other reasons of why it is in that way, that's the goal is I want to bring that in line. Because what it does, my body's going to work better. I, my blood pressure is going to be lower. My sugar levels are going to be more manageable. I'm going to be able to do more and be more active. So we look at all those circulation kinds of things. So we used to talk about dementia as hardening of the arteries. But everything old is new again. We're back to really emphasizing the cardio and cerebrovascular circulatory factors. So that's what we're really interested there. Aligned with that is one of the reasons why you may wake up feeling sleepy is because you may not be breathing properly while you're sleeping. So we find that in many ways, the thing that's missing from a lot of books and a lot of studies about dementia, but which we focus on in our practice, is the role of sleep disordered breathing, obstructive sleep apnea. When you have obstructed sleep apnea, you stop breathing multiple times per hour or your oxygen level drops by 3 or 4%. And if the combination of those two on average is five times or more, you have a treatable condition that if you're not treating it, is going to deprive your brain of oxygen and cause changes in how your brain works and how the connectivity of different parts of your brain is set up. So the secret sauce for many people is oxygen. So if we can then identify that and get them treated for their sleep apnea, suddenly they wake up in the morning with more energy. They've also slept better during the night. They're also not getting up to go to the bathroom as many times during the night. They're then more organized in their thinking. They're able to focus better and they remember more. If you take, and that's the, there's a researcher who's just retired out in California, I think it's San Diego, UC San Diego. Her name is uh, Ann Coley Dash Israel. And she did this fascinating study with large groups of women who were diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment. This is a state that's not quite normal, but not yet dementia, sort of a wake-up call. Well, they identified this whole group of them who had sleep apnea. This is hard to do because you get to be 70 years old, and your percentage, your likelihood of having sleep apnea with mild cognitive impairment is about 70%. Oof. Really prevalent. Half of them they treated with continuous positive airway pressure, CPAP. The other group they didn't, for whatever reason. 
They didn't follow her. They just didn't get treated with her. They followed them several years later. The group that was on the CPAP, very few of them developed dementia. Not true for the group that didn't treat their sleep apnea. So it turns out if you can diagnose this and if you can treat this, then people's brains do a lot better down the road. So there's that piece of it. Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. I have a tiny case study for you. A friend of ours went on a CPAP machine and one of the almost immediate effects besides feeling better in the morning was his blood pressure went down. His blood pressure wasn't at a bad level, but it wasn't at a, it was borderline and it Mm -hmm. went down to essentially normal. And he's, you know, he's probably in the right body size for his body. And, you know, he's pretty active. So like all the other factors were positive, but the biggest difference was, you know, getting the oxygen to the brain at night and his blood pressure went down. So that's, that was interesting to me to learn that. Here's a startling finding. This is really going to surprise you. Out of all the studies that are being done with new medications for Alzheimer's disease, not a single one of them measures the likelihood of sleep apnea in hmm. living groups. Wow. None of them separate on that. None of them look and say, well, maybe this medication would work better if people were getting oxygen to their brain. They just don't ask the question. And it may actually have washed out some otherwise positive benefits in some medications that the distinction between good outcome and no outcome was blurred by the fact that some or even half of the people in that study group may have a breathing problem that gets in the way of improved thinking. So we're on a crusade. We want people to breathe. Seriously. Well, it makes sense. Is there um, some indications that you could look at, like, look at yourself? Like, if you wake up in the morning, you're just, just yep. you- That's one of them. We call it non-restorative sleep. Falling asleep too quickly or too easily is actually also a sign. Back when I was diagnosed with sleep apnea, don't reveal here, 17 years ago. Ooh. I was not making it through the first act of most plays that I went to, was falling asleep in most movies that I took my kids to, even though they were action movies. I was actually interested in them. So falling asleep too quickly, head hits the pillow, bang your eye. Oftentimes is a sign. Uh, Snoring is a symptom that is really common. There are people who snore but don't have sleep apnea, and there are people who have sleep apnea but don't snore. But the overlap is pretty fine. Also, getting up multiple times to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. Turns out that not getting enough oxygen while you're sleeping through a long, about six-step process causes your kidneys to go into overdrive Hmm. to produce urine, to fill your bladder, to wake you up to go to the bathroom. And you come back to bed, and two hours later, without having drunk anything, 
You're up again. Where did they come from? It came from your body and your body's attempt to reduce the pressure around your heart and your lungs by pulling off fluid and turning it into urine. So if you got someone who's having some senior moments and they're feeling sluggish in the morning and they're falling asleep watching TV or reading in the evening and they're getting up to go to the bathroom multiple times and they're snoring, you hardly have to do the test. Yeah. That person, by definition, is going to test positive. And nowadays, they can do home sleep studies, which is really cool. You don't have to go to a hospital. You don't have to go to a sleep lab. In fact, in the very newest form of these, it's one thing that flips over your finger for money. Mm. Wake up the next day. And it's already sent through telemetry, the information to a board-certified sleep medicine doctor who interprets your results. And sends that back to your doctor or you. And so you can know from that very quickly whether or not you have sleep apnea. So this is less expensive than it ever was before. And it's becoming very common. So we, we want people to get, you know, at age 45 or 50, you should be getting a colonoscopy. If you're a woman, you should be getting mammogram. And everyone should be getting a home sleep study, in our opinion just because it's related to the risk of diabetes, hypertension, erectile dysfunction. Mm. Hmm. 50% of the men going for that little blue pill have sleep apnea. And when oxygen doesn't get to the periphery of your body, who are the major consumers? Your brain, your eyes, and then, oh yeah, down there. <laughs> You end up trying to get something which is going to expand your blood vessels to treat your erectile dysfunction. Well, it turns out if you're not getting enough oxygen, that's one of the causes. So it's interesting. We talk about that. Again, the eyes open up because people say, oh, do you have have a better romantic relationship if I treated my sleep apnea? Uh huh. Yeah. That's really interesting. So I've read recently about hearing loss being a risk factor, which I totally get because if you can't hear what's going on around you very well, you know, it makes it difficult to engage socially. So what, Sorry, what's your, what? Very much so. That's the next thing I was going to move into. Next okay. <laughs> no, it's, it's isolation, lack of cognitive stimulation and lack of sensory stimulation. The research on hearing is particularly interesting because for most people, their hearing loss is subtle and is progressive. It's not sudden. They don't wake up one morning not being able to hear. Usually it's so subtle they don't even recognize it, but they're turning up the volume on the TV. And they're more often asking people to repeat themselves. And they're deciding that everyone around them is suddenly mumbling. So getting a hearing test is really important than treating it with hearing aids. The research that's most recently come out shows a couple of things. Number one, for people with subtle hearing loss, there's a thinning of the surface of their brain in what's called the auditory association cortex. Cortex is the surface. Auditory is hearing. Auditory association between hearing and thinking. So there's actually a shrinkage of part of your brain that occurs. And the second thing that happens is they know this through something called functional MRI where they can have people sit in an MRI scanner and they can measure the background connectivity of different parts of their brain. There's different networks that connect our brain centers to each other. Well, it turns out that the most recent research shows that there's a, if you have a hearing loss, there's a loss in what's called the salience network. So what's salience? Salience is importance. Something is salient to you, it's meaningful. So in this case, there's less normal arousal and interest and taking in of information. So consequently, your brain is parked someplace else rather than paying attention to incoming information. And obviously, if it doesn't get in, it can't come back out again. So the hearing loss actually is physically a cause for hearing loss. So if we can get people tested, and we can get them to accept wearing hearing aids, which have now become deregulated, so it's a lot easier to get. 
they're also much smaller. So we don't have people saying, you know, I don't want to look old. I don't want to wear hearing aids. It'll make me look old. And I say to them, you know what really makes you look old? And they say, what? I say, yeah, exactly. That's it. What? What? What did you say? That makes you look old. That's true. Hearing people actually is a lot more youthful than constantly asking people to repeat themselves. Plus, life's a lot more enjoyable. So if someone gets hearing aids, I, I post, because they saw us today, because they heard me today, if they go out and get the hearing tested, then they get hearing aids. Do not treat them like the crown jewels. Don't just take them out for state occasions, like when someone's over. Put them in in the morning, wear them all day, take them out at night. Because the research suggests much of it is the background stimulation that's really important. So that refrigerator motor that's turning on and off is actually pinging your brain with the cell phone, power, causing it to respond. The birds chirping outside, that dog barking outside, all of those things, while they may be irritating in some way, are actually enriching your brain. It's also going to make it a lot more fun to be with other people. We know that people who are isolated are not going to think as well and are at greater risk for dementia than people who are actively engaged, people who are actively doing things. You know, for many people, retirement is never something they've taken a class for. That's so true. They go there and they go, okay, I've slept in for the last three weeks. Vacation's over. What do I do now? It's a, it's a tough problem. For a lot of folks, finding meaningful activity post-retirement becomes a real challenge. For some people, it's fine. You know, I've got a friend and uh, he important to play bridge and he reads three newspapers and he talks with all these different people and he goes for walks and he hangs out with the, playing pickleball and he's busier now than he was when he was working. There's some people like that, they're fine. But the other people who are sitting at home trying to figure out, okay, which station is it that doesn't have the news? And how do I watch reruns of this on the Lifetime channel? I think the problem with Lifetime, but thing. Those people are not using their brains enough. That makes sense. And doing some puzzles, doing some computer games is not going to cut it. You'll get better at doing computer games. That I know. Will you get better at thinking in general? will reduce your risk for dementia. We don't know yet. That's still to be established. You have a choice, go out and interact. Go to the senior center. Take a part-time job. Volunteer. Do something that's meaningful to you. Learn something new. Take a piano. Learn to sing. I don't care what it is. It's the activity of doing that's the critical thing not the what you're doing. For some people, it's a matter of like going to that that new restaurant that from a culture that they've never tried. They have to go and get the sample of platter first because they got to see. Okay, do I like this cuisine? And what about it? Do I like? Because the next time I'm going to come back, I want more of this and less of that. Well, it's the same thing about trying different things. You may not know what you want to do. That's okay. Try a lot of things. It's even better if you have a know-it-all friend who wants to drag you with all these things. <laughs> <laughs> I can get someone hooked up. Oh, yeah, my sister. She does this all the time. She wants me to go with her. Please go. That's what I tell them. You know, but she'll keep talking to me. I said, it's fine. You'll, you'll deal with it. You figure out for yourself what you want to continue doing. That makes sense. So before we suck up the rest of your day and, and anybody that I can't tell if anybody's watching because I got two computers going on here. Do you have like a nugget of advice on how to get past the inertia of making change? Good. Yes. Because I know it's hard. And then, like we said, you know, I went from non-exercising to being like freaking addict. Um, so it's possible. And I also reduced my sugar intake, which I have a genetic sweet tooth. My mom, her dad, meals weren't over till you had a sweet which we know sugar is not good for our bodies at all, especially our brains. But if I can make those changes, everybody can make necessary changes. So what's your nugget of wisdom on getting past the inertia of making these changes? Start with a small change 
in a really defined way. When someone says, I want to improve my health, you say, well, that's nice. That's a wish. What do you want to change? What's something that would make your health better? And then they might say, well, I'd like to reduce my weight. And I say, great, also a wish. What is it that you're doing that's keeping your weight where it is? So you have to go through this analysis. And it may be that I'm doing real well at meal time, but you know, every night around 10 o'clock, I feel the need to have cookies, ice cream, potato chips. And you say, I want you to do an experiment. I want you to try for a couple of weeks. I want you to not try. I actually want you to not do that for a couple of weeks. Don't do anything else different, but make that change. See what happens on the scale. And then see if you can do it another couple of weeks and see what happens. Now, if you want to pair it with a little more walking, great. So now you're doing two things in addressing that goal. And prepare to find times when you can't. That's not a reason for chucking the program. All that means is you have temporarily had a problem. It's sort of like today when we were starting the program, what we do, we unplugged, rebooted, started it again. Same yep. as I have for people wanting to make behavior change. Recognize that you run into an obstacle. Okay, that happens. If it was easy, you would have done it already. That is unplugged, true. Reboot. Go back to the original premise. What you'll find is over time, you really start to make gains and you can see, and then you can start using that process in other ways or other goals. It makes sense. So I have a Peloton and one of the one of the mantras that all the instructors use in different ways is you've already done the hard part. You've gotten, you've gotten here. You're in this class, you know. Um, and then many of them will say things like, you know, you didn't come to this 30 minute class to give 25 minutes, you know, as you're like, you know, hanging off the bike, wishing to die. <laughs> you're like, fine, I'll do the last five minutes. <laughs> and so and they also point out because there's um, for people who don't have Pelotons, there's. There's metrics that you should you know aim for. Well, if you're tired or your muscles are achy, because like me, I've been doing a lot of strength training. There's just days when it's like, that is not happening today. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. I don't have to hit the metrics every single day because that's just not even normal. And so they're very good at, at reminding you of all of those things. And for some people, having a coach like that is exactly what they need because they're so focused on what the coach is saying. They're not thinking for themselves, how many more minutes do I have? Why am I doing this stupid thing? You know, this is really not so you really focus on what they're saying, which is wonderful. For other people, that's not either needed or what they want. In fact, some people actually will rebel against it. You force them to do that, say, I'm not doing anything they want me to do. Uh, sometimes th the best way you can treat them is to give them the opposite instruction. <laughs> well, if you don't get this goal, then you're going to have to take this class or have this trainer. They will actually do the goal to spite you so they don't have to get the trainer. Got <laughs> customers, essentially. Well, that was like the client that told me I was screwed. It was like, I'll show you. I mean, but, I never saw that woman again. She has no idea what's gone on in my life and how I went from trying to avoid having the genetic family issue of diabetes, which I don't have, to learning that that also helped protect my brain because on my mom's side of the family, it was mom with Alzheimer's for 20 years. My maternal grandmother had vascular dementia for 15 and my maternal great grandmother also had senile dementia. She died before I was born. So I don't think they even knew the differences in dementias then. Yeah. I wouldn't know. I wasn't around. So, you know, I, I made the good choice for one reason and it's benefited me. Tremendously, you know, I hope <laughs> my mom, my mom had early it's onset Alzheimer's. See, the whole yeah. idea about prevention of a disease like dementia is that you can't guarantee the outcome. While you can reduce your risk by 50%, you might be in the other 50% just because. But it's like fire prevention. You can make your house as fire resistant and fireproof as possible 
But there are certain factors that are outside of anyone's control. I would submit that the act of working on it is far better than the passive acceptance or fear of it. Because whenever we're working towards something, we, by the very nature of working on it, are more in control of our lives. And for many of us, that's a much more positive kind of approach. You're living until you die. That's really critical. That is true. Well, I appreciate this. I appreciate your putting up with my tech klutziness today. <laughs> Maybe that should be one of those uh, test factors. Uh, how do you handle technology? <laughs> well, you're handling it better than most of the people I see, I think. Well, you know what happened? My husband came in the room and he goes, because he said, how's it going? And I said, I'm struggling. And he came down the stairs and he goes, what's going on? And I explained it to him. I'm like, oh, there's that other button that I missed. So I have very misogynistic technology. I can do the steps exactly as instructed. He can come in the room and now it works. Makes me insane. But hey, he came in the room. It worked. So we're all good. <laughs> Don't lose him. Well, he left, so hopefully he'll come back. <laughs> he went to the gym. All right. So, yes. So I appreciate this. And I will let you know when. So this will be um, available to replay on LinkedIn. Um, but I will also add it to my YouTube channel. And eventually it will be audio only on podcast players. So I will Excellent. let you know when all that happens. Please do. Pleasure. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.